for Alex Lifeson, Getty Lee, and Neil Peart, whose contribution, however vicarious, is of great influence and meaning. And to all Rush and Aftermath fans, past and present, your support is immeasurable. Fire Pit Creative Group presents Aftermath, Episode 38, Earthshine. All the way down. Past maintenance tunnels, security hatches. Between that bizarre amalgamation of old and new plumbing. Iron, clay, plastic. Down where pipes maneuver around long waves of wire. Faded colors that may have once been red or blue or green. Tin and copper exposed. Flicks of electricity. Sparks seem to call you. Ever onward. All the time, wondering. Cuddy, what the hell are you going to do when you get there? What won't you do? Now you sound like Dr. Bath. Irritating. Self-righteous. Splayed out somewhere. Beaten down by the men under your command. Under Colonel Marsh's command. Find her. Find Dana. Compel her, or convict her, or... Pry back fiberboard, framed, reframed walls. Push through broken wood. Decouple button-downed plastic walls. Punch, Cuddy. Force your way into that wide world of endless ceilings. The squalor has long earned its name, but for different reasons. In the tunnels under New York City, you couldn't smell the stench, the reek of flesh and fluid, garbage, polluted water. Here, fluorescent flickers, then dies. Pipes drip endlessly. Puddles pool. Refrigeration units, old generators, make walls of sound. Before you know it, you walk a few meters. You are swallowed up in it. Deep in the dungeon, men, Women in maintenance uniforms and hard hats stare at you. Those with no uniforms, tattered clothes, faces smeared, hands rugged, burned, whisper. What did you expect? They spy the uniform, emblems, chevrons. Did you want a greeting? Their complete compliance? Voices rise, many languages muddled. Bodies encroach, crowding you. Zoom in on spanners, crowbars, fists. Everything is a weapon. Feel your baton at your side, armored plates in your uniform, the electroconvulsive unit in its holster. Resist the urge to use them. Useless. Useless. You find your tongue as if it was lost in the green stream. Speaking in languages you know, or know enough of to say, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to arrest anyone. I need your help. Still closing in, they disbelieve. You know it. You give up the accents. Speak in your natural language. Please help me. Please. You sense their anger. Don't blame them. Fingers point. Hands swipe at your arms. You protect your weapons, your face. Keep your footing. 
They are about to consume you, Cuddy. And then, a voice calls out, pausing the crowd's forward movement. Hold it, the man says, his pitched voice commanding in an unexpected way. Let's hear what he has to say. You turn. Where did the voice come from? The crowd parts slowly. A tall, slender man steps forward. His graying hair is greasy, parted at the middle. His face is strangely ruddy, despite the lack of sun in the project. Uneven patches of white whiskers are scattered about his cheeks and chin. I know you, you hear yourself say. The man nods, comes closer. The crowd presses in on both of you. The man in front of you smells like pesticide, disinfectants, poison. I'm John's roommate. His breath is stale, sour. Mike, you recognize him. He nods, looks at the crowd. If you go now, you might make it out of here alive. After what happened at that, that show trial, everyone's on alert, on the defensive, you know? You glance around slowly, see the faces of the only truly international community in the Phoenix Project, the entirety of the United Nations, or what it was, represented in the eyes of the poor, the hands of the working class, the bent backs and stony glares. These are the dissidents, you say quietly, matter-of-factly. The multitude seems to break apart. Hell no! Mike exclaims, clearly disappointed. These people are the heart and soul of the Phoenix Project. Maybe some have their grievances, but these are the folks who make this project what it is. He points at the walls, the ceiling. They make sure the generators and cooling units work. Ensure the carbon dioxide we all breathe out doesn't kill us. They make sure the shit, excuse me, goes where it should and clean water comes out of the tap. That bugs and mice and rats don't run through the pipes. Listen, you start to say, and damn it, Mike interrupts you. They make it possible for the computer to spy on anyone, for Christ's sakes. He is frustrated, angry, and you don't blame him. That's what I want to talk. You hesitate a moment, glance around, lower your voice. That's what I need to talk to you about. Some of those around you continue to push, trying to get closer, to hear. Mike looks you over. He is taller than Dr. Bath, but shorter than you. Still, he seems to look down on you somehow. Mike bites the inside of his cheek, motions with his hand. Come on. You follow Helms through the crowd. He waves towards those with tools for weapons, suggesting they back off. You have more space, but can still feel the stairs. You call upon instinct to guide you. Mike pauses, stands between two cylindrical silos. Steam gushes from pipes in their roofs. You've spent your life, your career, following orders, looking out for yourself, those under your command. It's hard to be humble, to ask for help, to rely on others, especially those you were trained to distrust, investigate, interrogate. Listen, Mike. You hear the edge in your voice. Try to moderate it a little. These people don't want me here. I get it. What happened here was a travesty. And what happened up there? It was a miscarriage of justice. Mike stares blankly. You can hardly believe the words come from your mouth. But they do. And you feel a weight lift in your chest. So what the hell are you doing down here in the squalor? He asks. Down here with the sick, the poisoned, the forgotten. Why should anyone here help you? You take a breath. Exhale smoke, the harsh taste of nickel and copper-plated steel. I had nothing to do with it, you assure Mike. But I am responsible. Mike takes a step back. He is simple. Maybe the way you were before joining the team in the lab. You believed what you were told, followed orders, thought little about consequences in which you had no stake. 
<laughs> John Bath, you mutter, to Mike's surprise. What? What'd you say? You watch a line of men walk past you. They seem to crawl out of the woodwork and steal down here. John, Benjamin, all of them. You shake your head. Got me seeing things a different way. Not black and white. Not... Your voice trails off as you search for words. Squint your eyes as a plume of steam clouds the alley where you and Mike stand. <laughs> That'll happen, you know. Mike grins broadly. John will get his hooks in you, lead you round and round until you're either converted to his way of thinking, or you can't stand to be around him for days. You nod, agreeing, eyes watching. So what are you looking for? Mike finally asks. Lowering your voice, speaking close, you tell him. I'm looking for the room with the central processor. I thought it was in the command center, but... Now, wait a minute, what do you want with the computer? Mike asks, suspicious. I'm looking for someone. I think she's here, guarding the CPU. Please, Mike, I need your help. Mike holds a hand to his unshaven chin. Nobody here has access to the central processor. It's powered here and maintained here, but nobody has the key card to gain entrance to the room. Completely off limits. It's... Reaching into your uniform, you produce the odd-shaped card with the half-circled disc at the top. Mike's bloodshot eyes widen. He puts a hand over yours, urging you to hide the key. Come on, he insists. Come with me. You follow him between the curved, steam-spewing silos around a darkened corner. He leads you to a square hallway. Nothing like the carefully constructed, narrow corridors of the main walkways in the project. Watch your step. Mike points at the dented floor, puddles of what looks like petroleum. You step through a plastic curtain into a brightly lit waiting room. Smell the remnants of slaughtered animals, blood on the floor. Rectangular metal cubicles fill the room in no discernible pattern. Mike peers into one of the cubes. Isaac, Stanislaw, he calls, butchering the foreign names. Quit that for a sec. Come here. You peek over Mike's shoulder long enough to see a group of workmen in uniforms kneeling on the floor, playing some game. Gambling, mumbles the voice in your head. Vice. You search your mind for the law enforcement code you would call in if you were making an arrest. Two men rise from the game. Follow Mike around the wall of the little room. What the hell do you want? The leader of the two men asks. Big eyes grind into you. Mike tries to explain. This is Isaac Gerhardt and Stanislaw Havila. They work on the conduits of the CPU. Isaac, Stan... This is... Damn it, Helms. Havela is smaller and younger than the other workmen. This may be the squalor, but our work is still classified. He, he needs our help, and... Mike glances back at you, his face strangely warm, kind. And I... I, I guess I trust him. You guess? Havela nudges Mike, his pointy chin close. You want maybe to corrupt the processor? Isaac grumbles. You wear law enforcement uniform. Perhaps this is set up. Do you have a warrant? Havela sneers. It's not a setup, you say firmly. Just show me where the processor is. There is an awkward silence. Nothing but the clang of metal. The drip drop of puddling fluid. Think, Cuddy. Think. I have this you say, holding the keycard between the group. The men look at each other, at Mike, at the keycard, back to you. Hmm. Stanislaw scratches his head. Follow us, and don't get lost. Try anything, and we kill you. Yeah. Gerhard puts his hand on Mike's chest, pushing him out of the circle. From here on, you don't know us, and we don't know you. I owe you one. You cringe to hear yourself say the words. Damn right you do. 
As Isaac leads the way through the squalor, he looks back at you. You owe us all. Stanislaw leads the way, with you between him and the heavyset, expressionless Gerhardt pulling up the rear. If they are leading you into danger, you can probably take them both, but not easily. Not on their turf, where friends, cohorts, lurk in bunks, or hover on elevated catwalks. For a few minutes, Mike lingers nearby, peering around corners, watching. Then, he recedes back. You follow through a series of rooms with no doors. Corroded, green mildew-covered drop ceilings hang overhead. Each room is filled with lounging technicians, maintenance personnel, scanning circular monitors. You wonder, how can they see anything on screens so small? Finally, you are in a larger, octagonal room. Iron walls, deep rivets, rusted bolts. An enormous, metal half-sphere sits in the center of the room. Massive conduits flow in and out of the globe. It draws energy, pulsates like a mechanical bladder, sends out information through wires curving out, up, above you. Lights flash, flicker, fade. What is it? you ask, mouth hanging open. Central processor. Stanislaw says, a hand outstretched. He bypasses a trail of cords, cables, walks up to the metal frame rising at least six feet higher than him. It curves at its peak, bending down, disappearing into the floor. You approach, cautiously, your imagination alive, heart racing. The keycard goes there. Gerhard points at a metal box rising out of the floor. Yellow, antiquated buttons, not unlike the radio terminal and the command center. You withdraw the keycard, hold it close to your chest. You're not sure what you're feeling. Fear? Anticipation? Is Dana in there? If so, what will she say? If not... Go on, Gerhard tells you. You turn glance between the two men. See Mike Helms' silhouette several meters back, clinging to the wall. A stranger who should not be here. Raise the key. Inject it into the narrow slot. The disc is sucked in slowly. Suddenly, a metal cage ensnares your hand. Inside, you still grasp the card. Feel pinpricks on your fingertips, the center of your palm. The pain is cursory, Unexpected, but nothing you can't handle. The cage opens. The keycard is spit out without the circular disc. Your palm is numb. A circular portal before you opens. Metal slides smoothly back like massive eyelids opening. White light blazes from the chamber. Spiderweb patterns crisscross on the dirt brown floor. From outside the chamber, you discern the hum of power sources, the click and clatter of ancient machines. Bathed in light, you gaze at the men who escorted you there. You nod, a courtesy. If anything happens, you start to say, You're on your own, they reply in unison. As soon as you step inside the ovoid chamber, the doors close behind you without a sound. At the center of the imminently clean, brightly lit room is a tower of technology. Devices and instruments that put all of Donna Chang's components in the lab to shame. A seven-foot wall of steel, rectangular boxes encircle a litter of other devices. The tall boxes contain spinning wheels, reel-to-reel cartridges spinning back and forth. Oversized lights glimmer yellow, Orange. Red. On. Off. On. A pattern you are unable to follow. Step between the tall machines. There, you find a heap of electronic hardware. Ancient personal computers in beige, black, 
Purple. Busted silver and champagne laptops wired into block power supplies. Tape drives piled on industrial appliances. Power conduits, parallel wires, and serial conduits seemed to fly in and out of the monolith of devices, charting inexplicable paths in and around the machines, down into batteries, ports in the pristine white floor. The tower of technology forms a kind of pyramid. Not a central processor, you think? No. A globe-shaped room, full up, with hundreds of processors. Old machines interfacing with new ones, retrofitted or repaired. The central processor is a hideous, cannibalized monster. Everything the Phoenix Project was desperate to keep hidden. Reach out to one of the lit laptops, its screen broken off. Feel the swift, unexpected kick in your back. Stagger forward, a fist in your ribs, your left kidney. Brace yourself on the mountain of tech. Hit your head on the way down to the floor. Turn. Colonel Dana Marsh, your second mother, mentor, commanding officer, looms over you. She wears no uniform, no armor. Instead, she is outfitted in a simple halter top with a shoulder holster, cargo shorts, combat boots. Her shorn, shoulder-length hair is unwashed, reveals streaks of silver and gray. Her skin is clammy, lips cracked. Don't move, she commands you, holding taped fists close to her chest. I didn't come here to fight. You resist your every instinct. Then what the hell are you doing here? How'd you get in? You roll on your back, try to push yourself up. Colonel Marsh's boot pushes into your chest. Stay where you are, or I'll... Damn it, Colonel. Dana. It's me. Cuddy. You could swipe her feet. But then what? You're with them, she hollers. They've turned you. What the hell are you talking about? Your friends in the lab, Cuddy. John Bath. The dissidents. Don't make me... Make you do what? You interject. I was worried about you, Colonel. So I went looking for you. I found the keycard you left. Slowly, you reach into your uniform. I didn't leave any keycard for you, Marsh shouts. Bloodshot eyes narrow. The scar over her right eye seems more prominent. You hold up the keycard. Where did you get that? Marsh asks, eyebrows raised. You left it in your quarters. Left it with all that other stuff. The printouts and surveillance reports. I figured... You figured wrong, she snaps, desperately. I don't know what you're talking about. I certainly didn't leave a key card to this room, and I sure as hell don't know about any surveillance reports. You squint, try to put it all together. Colonel, you inhale, exhale. Can I please stand? We can talk about this. I'm just trying... I'm just trying to understand it all. Marsh relents, backs away a few feet. You stand, glance around, figure out how you would escape or get the upper hand on the skilled combat specialist if you had to. Dana, you're restraining yourself now. I saw the drugs, the pills. I found this keycard in your room, the surveillance reports, my father, Bath's father, everyone in the damned project. You had no right, she shouts back. Dana, Colonel, tell me what's going on. I can help you. A long pause passes between you. The machines continue crackling, whirring, spinning. Marsh drops her fists, relaxes her stance, backs away between two lofty, reel-to-reel computers. You didn't sign the warrant, did you? You speak matter-of-factly. You didn't send Baker and Reed to take out Santiago and the dissidents. Marsh lowers her head, then looks up. It was my signature on the warrant, Cuddy. But I have no memory of signing it. You nod. I knew there was no way you would give them carte blanche to recruit untrained citizens, 
to harass and beat down women and children. Marshall Owls, a plaintive grin, nods. I was... Cuddy. I was stoned out of my mind when they executed the arrests, when they brought everyone to the stockade. I was just as surprised as... It's... It's happened before. I know. You reach out. Marsh withdraws, crosses her arms at her chest. You've always covered for me, Cuddy. But since you've been engaged in the lab, I've... I've been slipping more and more. Nothing, nothing is the way it should be. But, Dana, isn't that what the drugs and medication are for? If there's something wrong, you really should see Miral, Dr. Ganaya. I'm sure she can help you. I'm sure. He reached for the colonel, warily. <laughs> oh, Cuddy. Marsh cocks her head sideways. You're a talented investigator, a brilliant officer, but sometimes... You can be so naive. Taken aback, you feel the angry expression on your face. I mean, Marsh continues, in an innocent, sweet way. Why do you say that? If you're sick, haven't you ever wondered why there's always 3,000 people in the project? Why some are allowed to reproduce while seniors are forced into the convalescent home at a certain age? Shake your head. Think it through what you've been told, what the council broadcast, what conspiracy theories the dissidents proffered. I guess I just... I always figured it's what was in the best interest of the project, that people lived and died, and when it was their time... No, Marsh holds up a hand. First, they get you hooked on pills, call them vitamins, and for a while, it's wonderful. Then... Your liver, your kidneys start to go, and you need more. Then it's your memory. You sleep too much, but you can't remember sleeping, so you take amphetamines. Then you can't even remember taking the drugs, but you'll do anything to make... Marsh pauses, eyes wide, looking you over. You'll do anything to make the pain, the blankness, go away. And before you know it, it's too late. They put you out to pasture, and a droid moves in, takes over your duties while you spend the rest of your blessed days hooked up to a machine, your body withering away, your brain turning into a turnip in the old folks' home. You gaze at Marsh, as if seeing her for the first time. Her uniform gone, she seems more human, approachable, and yet, everything she says is distant, disturbing. You reach out to her, touch firm, sweat-soaked shoulders. Colonel, Dana, that can't be. How do you... How do you know that will happen to you? It is happening to me! She withdraws, teeth gnashed. It's my time, Leonard, and this is all I have left. She waves a clenched fist at the wall of computers, the climbing pyramid of technology. I tried to tell you that. You have to be my successor. You have to train someone else. The project has to stay alive. This generation of Phoenix citizens is never going to the surface. We aren't ready. No, you say defiantly. We can go to the council. We can do something. Make them listen like the general did. We can change this. Don't be ignorant, Cuddy. I'm on the council. You asked me before. The answer is yes. Yes, I'm on on the council. Stunned, you take a step back, hear your boot heel click on the floor despite the loud beeps and hums around you, feel your back against a machine. And the council does the will of the computer. You speak the words you've said too many times to count, words spoken to those arrested, incarcerated, under suspicion, a statement spoken as if you were programmed like the interconnected pile of tech behind you. Yes, Cuddy, the Shadow Council does the will of the central processor. Marsh speaks the original name of the council, nods at the computers behind you. Who, you demand? Who else? 
Council members don't know each other's identities. You know that, Leonard. Bullshit. You know. Maybe not all of them, but you're a cop. You know. Marsh sighs deeply with her whole body. Her hands shake. Who? Catherine Rand, the Dean of the Academy. Maricela Santiago. The lunch lady? The head of the dissidents? You ask, surprised, now realizing why minor crimes and acts of terrorism were allowed to go on for so long. Why your hands were tied, despite your best efforts. The dissidents and the council are one and the same, Marsh relents. Who else, you demand? I don't know, Marsh looks up. A few younger citizens, no one you know. Is it Bath? Ganaya? Chang? No, Marsh says quickly. Each of them had trustworthy benefactors on the council, but none of them are on the council. And as far as I know, none of them are aware of who recommended you lied to me. You stop her. You deceived me. My whole life. My whole career. I loved you, Cuddy. I protected you. No, Dana. You taught me to trust the council. To follow orders. That's what we do, Leonard. Marsh hunches slightly, points at the ceiling. This is what happens when we don't follow orders. Chaos. Law enforcement against dissidents. Citizen against citizen. Deep disappointment crawls over every nerve. You want to fight the woman who helped raise you, who made clear your path. My mother, you say, voice low. You try to hide insecurity, fear. What, you want me to say it? You want me to tell you she didn't die of cancer? If that's what you're asking. After Mac died, she survived for a while. She was a homemaker, no longer useful to the project. They started her on a cocktail of... Dana doesn't finish. She's unable to speak the rest. Tears well in your eyes. Blood gushes from where you bite into your bottom lip. You realize you have nothing anymore. No past. No truth other than your life in the lab with General Castro, Dr. Bath, and the others. You bend down for a split second. Then, you leap at Marsh, fists out at her sides, trapping her against the wall. Marsh swiftly ducks, eludes your grasp. You spin around, find yourself staring down the barrel of an automatic pistol. Don't do anything stupid, Leonard. Marsh peers down the gun sights. Don't make me. I don't want to. She pauses, tears in red eyes. Don't want to do what, Dana? You raise your hands, but slightly, calculating your next move. Blast my head off? Are you serious? Her posture, the tears in her eyes are her response. Maybe Marsh has nothing else to live for. Maybe she'll take you with her. There's no point in hiding it from you anymore, she says, then swallows hard. You want to know why I came here? You shake your head, wave at the central processor. You came to protect that mound of mush. Dana laughs. <laughs> Turn around. So that's how it's going to be, huh? You're going to shoot me in the back? I don't want to, Cuddy. She waves the weapon slightly. But if you don't, I swear to God, I will. You'll try, you say, and then you turn, walking with your hands up. Your thoughts are filled with memories. All the stuff that flooded back and forth in your mind as you slid through the green stream. Images of your childhood. Your father. Your mother. Your innate sense of self-discipline. Disgust at those who had none. Move, Marsh pushes you forward, guiding you around the circular wall of ancient computers. So that's it, huh? You step forward. Every few seconds you feel the gun barrel aimed up at where your neck and skull meet. What? Marsh pauses. She points around you at the ground. A barely visible perforation appears in the all-white floor. A hook. A hatch. 
The reason the council gives Danielle and Benjamin vague, unhelpful directives. Just keep going, they say. We'll take your recommendations under advisement. They have no plan, no operating procedure. They know nothing. They just want to study how the technology works, if it works. But when it's time, we'll no longer be useful to them. Like my mother wasn't useful to them. They'll send someone else up to the surface, let them wander around aimlessly, giving them instructions. Don't alarm the citizens. Don't get your hopes up. Shut up, Marsh orders. Open that airlock. And don't do anything stupid. I know your fighting tactics. You kneel down, clasp a painted white hook, pull open the meter-long door in the floor. Not to mention, you have the pistol. I didn't want it to be like this. Marsh motions at the hole in the floor, waves the gun. Now, get your ass in there before I do something I will regret for the rest of my short life. You climb into the hole, first thinking if you can grapple Marsh's legs. Then, you wonder why she called it an airlock. Does she intend to leave you here? To suffocate you? Kill you? without being the one to pull the trigger? You walk down a few short stairs. Marsh follows behind you into a darkened room. Light from a console in the center of the room casts shadows across the floors, against the walls. It takes a moment for your eyes to adjust. You realize this compartment is the bottom half of the sphere you saw when you were in the squalor. Colonel Marsh stands behind you, waves the gun at you, motions for you to stand at the curved right side of the chamber. So that's your plan? You off me down here? Leave me? Marsh stands at the console at the center of the room. She lowers the pistol. This is your chance, you think. This is your moment. Now or Dana presses a bright blue button on the console. You hear motors grinding, hydraulics hidden in the walls. Marsh waves the gun at you, gesturing for you to watch behind you. Reluctantly, you turn. Watch as a blast shield slowly peels back on the circular wall. Radiant light seeps in, a cosmos of imagery you've only seen in video books. You see stars, brilliant, beautiful, on the ink blackness of space. Somewhere in the distance, you see what looks like another planet, lingering, yet alive. Below you, Earth sits in indescribable blue, green, and white. You feel sick, like you will fall through the floor. You imagine yourself floating, all tension you've ever felt escaping your body, instinct and muscle memory lost. Marsh comes to stand next to you, her gun dangling at her side. You are expressionless. I've wanted to show this to you for so long. Light illuminates Marsh's tired face. Tears stream down her cheeks. She closes her eyes as if at peace, defenseless, uncaring. Isn't it lovely? You don't know what to say. And you remain silent, watching as the Phoenix Project hovers over Earth, over the North Pole, drifting.
Aftermath, a Fire Pit Creative Group production, based on a story created by Rhett Davis, with characters created by Rhett Davis, Warren Davis, Willem DeGrieff, and Cole Hoopengarner. Written by Warren Davis, with contributions from Cole Hoopengarner. Narrated and produced by Cole Hoopengarner. Music by Warren Davis, and video production by Willem DeGrieff. The sound effects used in the production of Aftermath are used with permission by the creators, and links to these sound effects can be found in the description section of each episode. Please visit our website, aftermathpodcast.net, for updates, original artwork and music, character dossiers, and more. You can also find us on social media, on Instagram at Fire Pit Creative Group Official, on Twitter at Group Fire Pit, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Fire Pit Creative Group, and on YouTube at Fire Pit Creative Group. Aftermath and its story, characters, music, and artwork are copyrighted by Fire Pit Creative Group. Thank you.